All right, church, let's talk about love. What does it mean to love God? But before we get into that, I have a question, pop quiz for you. What is God's favorite tool? What do you think God's favorite tool is? Go ahead, discuss amongst yourself. What do you think? Or you could say it down in the chat or the comments. What do you think God's favorite tool is? What do you think? Is it a hammer? Like God is ready to bring the hammer down? I don't think so. Perhaps, if I had to take a guess, I think God is more of a woodworker. You know, first of all, Jesus was a carpenter. But God is not in the business of hammering things down. And if I had to pick a favorite tool, I think it would be sandpaper. Now hear me out. Okay, God is not about breaking down and coming against. God is a God of redeeming love. And sandpaper has a lot of uses. You can use sandpaper to smooth things over, to, to whittle it down to a better shape. Or if something gets broken and it's glued back together and it, you know, it needs to be uh, put back to good use, sandpaper can take away the edges, take away the roughness, and make it beautiful and useful again. And I think we need to think of God more like that and less like a hammer or, or other things that we can sometimes think of coming to God when we mess up or when we fail, like he's ready to you know, do something to us or take something away from us. But God is in the business of redemption and repurposing and reorienting. And we need this. We need to think this way because I think we have a tendency sometimes when we mess up, when we fail, when something gets broken, we either give up or run away or, or try to you know, pick up the pieces and earn our way back. And, you know, oh, I feel like I can't be used useful anymore. We might beat ourselves up. And, and these all come from misconceptions about God, about who God is. And listen, this isn't just us in the church. People in the world, people in our community have certain concepts of God. And, and there are people, I've literally heard people honestly say, well, I don't think I can go to a church because I've done too much bad stuff. I might burst into flames or something. There are people who don't realize that God is a God of redeeming love. And thus, people can feel disqualified. You might feel disqualified. People out there might feel disqualified, like they can't come in. And so today, we're going to talk about how God takes Peter from being a failure to being focused. Okay, we're going to see that it, with God, those who have failed can become focused. God brings us from failure through forgiveness into focus. And what we're going to see is that it is these three things in Peter's life. Okay, he, he is a failure. Okay, he renounces Jesus. He denies Jesus. But then he's redeemed. Okay, he's redeemed and then he's reoriented to focus on his purpose. Peter himself is brought from failure through forgiveness and into focus. And if you want to follow along, we're going to be looking first at Peter's failure in Luke 22. Luke chapter 22, and we're starting in verse 54. And then a little later, we're getting into John 21. So if you want to put a mark there or put your finger in there, uh, you can do that. But first, let's look at Peter the failure. And this is in Luke chapter 22. This is where Peter renounces Jesus. Okay, and we, we see in this story, if you start in verse 54, Jesus was seized. Okay, remember last week, Jesus was in the garden. He was uh, grieved unto death, he said. He was praying. He, the, the cup of what he was about to take in, dying for the sins of people, bearing the sins of the world, and God turning away from him and letting him die, this was what Jesus was about to face. He prayed, he was ready, and he was resolved to do what God had called him to do. And then we see that those who were coming to betray Ju Judas and his crowd of you know, people armed and ready to take Jesus away. They came and they seized him. They led him away and they brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. So we got Peter trying to go incognito here, trying to follow, maybe trying to save Jesus. We don't know really what his intentions are here, but there's a fire lit and he goes and he kind of stands among them. And then in verse 56, it says, a servant saw him sitting in the light, looked closely at him, and she said, this man was with him too. But Peter denied it. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, 
Someone else saw him and said, You're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. About an hour later, another kept insisting this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. If you remember from last week, Peter said, I got Jesus, I am ready. I will die with you no matter what. I will never abandon you. And here we see three times because of a little peer pressure, a little bit of danger, risk, messing up the mission, who knows what, Peter denies Jesus. And we see that the rock turns out to be about as firm as jello. Okay, and, and Peter, his response, as we'll see as the story continues on, is to give up, to say, you know what, I guess it's over. I'm done. You know, and, and, and there's the cross in here. We're going to talk about that in a second. But we see that Peter has the tendency to do to go the wrong way. It's just like we talked about last week. We are weak and we all mess up. And we've talked about that many times. But in the, the mistake, we have these tendencies, right? And Peter's tendency in the loss and the, in the mistakes here is to give up. Okay, he's going to go back to fishing, as we'll see in John chapter 21. And, and, he's, and sometimes we do that. We, we hide away or we say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. Forget it. Or, or we get hostile or we say, well, it's just not fair. And, and what happens is, is really people think that their failures bar them from life with God. And again, that's not just in the church. People outside of the church, one of the top five issues with coming to church or, or giving Christianity a chance is... I'm not good enough. I have messed up too much. God can't forgive. And that's so silly because we know there is no sin big enough to be stronger than the mercy of the cross. No sin can, can be stronger than the grace of God. But people think this way. Like, I can't get in. I'm not good enough. And we need to change that. We need to give ourselves grace. And we need to help other people realize that there is grace, right? For the outside, they need to know God has grace for you. And for inside the church, we need to know that we've already been given grace. We're living in grace upon grace. And we need to give ourselves grace. And listen, we can do that. You know, people say, well, I don't want to, you know, minimize my sin. That's, that's a good, that's a good intention. Don't minimize your sin. But listen, the Bible is very clear. All sin is against God. All sin is offensive to God. And Jesus, looking at his disciples, called out all of these offenses beforehand. He said, you're going to deny me. You're going to abandon me. And I'm going to die. And yet Jesus, knowing that, walked with them shared with them the, the table of the Lord's Supper, saying, you know, this is your new covenant. Jesus loved them, and he blessed them, and he knew that they were going to abandon him, and yet he never abandoned them. So listen, if Jesus can live with grace with those who are abandoning them, you can give yourself grace. Your failures aren't the end. You don't need to think, well, I failed. I'm just, you know, it's, it's done forever. Forget me. I'm worthless. Give yourself grace. Grace. And again, that doesn't mean we excuse sin. That doesn't mean we say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be lazy about sin. I'm going to be relaxed. It's the, uh, you know, forget righteousness. I'm just going to give myself grace. No, no, no. We, we don't give ourselves a license to sin. That's a complete misunderstanding about grace. But we also don't let our failures become our focus. Our failures cannot swallow up all our thinking. We can't dwell on our failures because that does not bring us into the way of Jesus. You know, I used to think when I was younger, because I, you know, I grew up in the church and yeah, I, I kind of ran away for a while and whatever, but I used to think that I needed to like every day think of each instance of forgiveness I needed, even though I believed I was a Christian. I, I just thought I, I had to think of each instance of forgiveness I needed and I would think back and say, okay, I did that. Yes, God, I need to, oh God, forgive me for that. And Oh, I, th I did that, and God forgive me for that. And um, oh, and I need, and I would think, oh well, oh, did I do everything yesterday? So oh, let's think about yesterday. And oh, maybe last week I missed some things. And what if there were things I missed? Oh God, like uh, God, can you just give me like a, a 
you know, backwards forgiveness that day and that day and that day. And I, and I, I thought like I had to ask for forgiveness to get forgiveness on each little thing. Like, like, you know, I might miss something and then I was going to actually live with like this unforgiveness badge in my past. And it was like, oh, I hope I one day remember it. And, and that is not the cross. Listen, that is not the good news of the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, and, and here we are where Peter has failed miserably and Jesus is about to go to the cross. And uh, we're going to see some, the cross is a, a very, very powerful, of course, uh, where <laughs> everything is centered on the cross for us. So let's turn to John 21. And as we turn to John 21, you need to recognize that we're going from pre-cross to post cross and that's a major threshold to cross because it changes everything and we're turning a page to John 21 but history has turned a page in here and what we're going to see that is that in the cross there has been full forgiveness there has been redemption okay Peter renounced Jesus and now there is redemption okay and when before Jesus went to the cross he said he said I'm going to give my life as a ransom. He says, I came here to rescue. I came here to seek and save the lost. And he goes to the cross to bear sins, just as John the Baptist, prophet of God, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry said, here's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And we need to hear this. This is, this is reality, because as Jesus is on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. Jesus gave up his life. He gave up his life for the kingdom, his life for God. He gave up his life for the mission. And, and honestly, it's radical. Like, it is finished. This is a radical statement. It's more radical than we realize. Seriously, it's, it's even, we could say, unfair. The cross of Jesus Christ has brought full forgiveness, past, present, and future. Total forgiveness forever for those who believe in Jesus. Relating to God is radically changed from being under the law. You know, where you had to, you know, you mess up. Okay, we're going to store up these mistakes and then you're going to have to pay for them and then you're good. And, you know, they had a yearly atonement service where they'd pay for their sins. And, and people still think that way. Like, I need to, you know, I need to do something every once in a while to, to pay for my sin. Under the, the gospel, through the cross, relating to God has changed. And so... If we look to John chapter 21, post-cross, okay, we're, we're told that it's, everything's changed. When we read through that account in, in each gospel, everything's changed. And so Jesus comes to reveal himself again. Here he's going to call out Peter for, he, he's going he's gonna to call out what happened. You failed. And, and he does it indirectly, but we're going to see that in a second. First he comes and he, he sees that there's this group of disciples, they they were together, and Peter says, I'm going fishing, right? I'm done. Like this plan, this mission, all these things, Jesus is dead. I'm done. I'm out of here, you know, and, and they had seen Jesus, and uh, here's all this stuff, but it's like, you know, it's over. I failed. We're done. And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. They say, okay, we're coming with you back to the old ways. But then daybreak came, and Jesus stands on the shore. And the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called out to them, you don't have any fish, do you? It's starting to sound a lot like something that happened before, isn't it? And so this time, Jesus doesn't just say, hey, cast your net. He says, hey, you got nothing, hey? No fish, you failed. And they, and they answer, no, no fish. See, Jesus says, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loves, says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Simon Peter heard that and he jumps out and he swims toward Jesus. That's a little different, isn't it? Last time it was, he saw, you know, there was this calling happening of you're going to do a miraculous catch and Peter runs away. This time Peter runs to Jesus. So it seems like something's sinking in, right? And then we see Jesus with a, a strong but gentle rebuke. And now I just want to pause here for a second and think. At the beginning, Peter knew he was a failure. He tells the Lord, you know, at the beginning of their relationship, Jesus does the miracle, says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you to do, be fishers of men. And Peter says, go away, I'm sinful. Okay, and now 
Now Peter's lived it. You know, yes, we're fishers of men. We're part of it. And then they give up because, you know, yes, Jesus died. They knew he came back to life. And they say, well, I failed. I failed. And I'm assuming that's why he's going fishing. I mean, it doesn't tell us directly, but he, he, he went back to his old way. I failed and I'm going fishing. And Jesus comes and says, look, you failed. But look. It's still happening. And at the end of the account, he's going to say, follow me. Peter is being drawn back in. But in it, they're eating breakfast and Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? And we might even, if you, someone asks that three times, you might say, do you really love me? Like, do you really, are, are you serious? Do you love me? And it hurts Peter. But Jesus comes in and he's not, He's not minimizing what happened. He's not enabling Peter. He's not ignoring it because it was costly. But Jesus coming in is asking this question, do you love me? Like, who are you? Do you really love me? And he's going to point him to the mission, as we'll see in a second. But here, there's an important lesson. What does Jesus not do? Jesus doesn't come and say, you need to, you know, earn your way back. You know, you're in the, the proverbial doghouse of ministry here. No. He de Peter doesn't come groveling. Jesus doesn't come and like try and emphasize and say, you know, look what you did. The, your wrongness, your wrong deeds were so wrong that, you know, as if Peter's got to pay something back if he's going to get into the right way. And, and that's important because I think, you know, even that story I said about me always asking for forgiveness, we think this way. We tend to think this way that we need to like do something to get our forgiveness in Jesus. And I'm talking in Jesus here. If you're, if you're a child of God, if you're in Christ, I'm talking to you. Asking for forgiveness is not what gets us forgiveness. Now listen, I know, I know this, this could be an argument sometimes for some people, but, but listen, in the Bible, after the cross, there is no point where a Christian has to say, ah, oh, you know, I need to be re-forgiven. That doesn't happen in the Bible. So you can read it. I've read it many times. It doesn't happen. We're not told that we need to ongoingly be re-forgiven by God as if, you know, we're, we're on this slate and the slate's blank, but oh, we mess it up. God, please clean it again. We're not told that once. And, you know, some people bring up, well, what about 1 John 1, 9, where he says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The context of that, if you look at it, is people who think they don't sin, they don't need forgiveness. And John's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Yes, you do need forgiveness. You need Jesus to bring you forgiveness. So if you confess, you will be forgiven. And the whole rest of the letter, he's like, we're in the light. We're clean. We're pure. Okay? We are, we are not forgiven by repeatedly asking for forgiveness. We are forgiven by the cross of Jesus and by being united with him in faith. And if you want a lesson in this, Hebrews is huge. Like once for all time, he paid the price. We are forgiven fully, finally, and forever. Now, when we sin, do we, do we say, oh, God, that is wrong. I don't want to do that. I hate that. And that's not me. I don't like sin. I want to figure out how I can avoid that failure. Yes, yes and amen, we do that. But we are not ongoingly forgiven by asking again and again and again for forgiveness. Now, is God, you know, upset with you when you ask for forgiveness? I don't think so. But I would imagine he smiles and says, you are forgiven. You are fully and finally forgiven. And listen, we need to hear this because we need to tell this, right? Our community needs to know that it is not about doing enough good. It is about being forgiven because of what Jesus has done. And that changes lives, right? The, the thought that Jesus paid the price, that changes lives. And we need to go to the, the community, to the world and say, Jesus paid it. And he's inviting you in. And the forgiveness is free. And that's troubling sometimes because, listen, people, for Christians and non-Christians, think that they have to pay. Like, yeah, sure, I was forgiven, but now I've messed up and I have to pay somehow. Like, I've got to dwell on it. I have to grovel about it. Maybe I have to lose some blessing. But the funny thing is, that is totally a reward and punishment mentality. That is a law-based system where you say, I messed up, I got to lose something, and I got to get my standing back to where it was. That is not the cross. And listen, this is honestly what makes the cross offensive. 
Because the cross is offensive. Because either you think you earn things and the cross says no. You don't. It's the cross. Or you think you, you know, you're too, uh, you know, that, that's too easy. That's too easy. And that becomes offensive. And honestly, Paul, so Paul is one of the people who wrote a lot of the New Testament, a lot of the letters that talk about Jesus. Paul, he was chosen by Jesus to be a messenger to the world. And, and so he had the message. And he was constantly criticized. You read through his letter. He was always criticized for preaching too much grace. It's too free, Paul. The forgiveness is too good. You need to stop because you're going to make people sin when they think that the forgiveness is free. And, and that way, Paul was criticized for this all the time. Because listen, people either want to earn it, so they have this pride of like, yes, I did it. I'm good enough. I can get into heaven. I'm good with God. Or they think it's unfair. Like, oh, really? A murderer can just be forgiven because of what Jesus has done? Well, Yes, <laughs> that's how big the sacrifice of the Son of God is. That is how big it is that Jesus, the Son of God, the one who created the world and everything in it, was put on a tree that he created, was upheld as he died by a world that he created, and was murdered by weak, puny worms that he created. That is how big this is. And so here in Peter's story, we see that he did this you know, sin we could call as a, you know, huge sin. Okay, he denied his friend who he said he'd never deny and who he committed his life to, who he knows is the Son of God. He denied him and avoided him and he got murdered. That's pretty big. And, and yet Jesus doesn't come and say, hey, time to apologize, time to grovel. In fact, what he does is something that you might never expect if you don't read it. He comes and he just asks Peter to confirm something. Confirm who you are. Confirm who you are to me, and then I'm going to reorient you. Okay, you've, you've gone off the path. Is it, hey, you went off? No. Who are you? Do you love me is the question. And okay, follow in this path. And the mercy of God is amazing because actually if you look back in Luke 22, Jesus said to Peter, you know, you're, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. So when you've turned again, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. He says, I, I knew that I know what's coming. I love you. You know, I'm praying for you. And when you've turned, carry on in the path. That is focus. The, the failure is met with forgiveness and is turned to focus. And just like we saw, we saw at the beginning, Jesus called Peter at the beginning of his ministry with the fish, the miracle with the fish. He called Peter and he says, you will do what's impossible. You will draw people into my kingdom. And now Peter has messed it up. He's gone back to his old way. And Jesus comes back and he says, hey, you're back in. You're in. Come, you know, go in my way. That, that hasn't changed. What Jesus called Peter to hadn't changed. The mission wasn't ruined by Peter failing. And so Peter runs to him, and Jesus points him back to the right path. And listen, church, the Spirit of God is doing this constantly in our lives. And if you're in tune with the Spirit, you know this. You're walking down the wrong way, and you just feel or you hear the voice of the Spirit saying, No, that's not the way. This is the way. That's not the way. This is the way. And listen, it's not a voice of condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We're reoriented back into the way. We're turned from failure to focus. And so when Jesus asks, do you love me? We see that P Jesus is saying the, the redemption is real. You, yes, you love me. Jesus knows the answer. And yet he's asking him, confirm, do you love me? Okay, then the redemption is going to turn to action. The love is going to turn into mission. And, and you know, when God says something three times to you, you listen. And Peter listens and it changes his life. And for you, you are in Peter's shoes. You're in the same place because, listen, Jesus could ask and I guess does ask, do you love me? And we're told if you look at Ephesians 6, the end of Ephesians 6, Paul says, we are those who have an incorruptible love for Jesus, or in other translations, an undying love for Jesus. The Spirit of God has poured the love of God into your heart. Now your heart, your true, who you truly are, loves Jesus. And so when Jesus asks, do you love me? The answer is yes. He's put that in you. And the, and the call is then come back into the way. Walk 
in my way. Use that love to fuel the task that he's called you to. And we could say the church is always under construction. Okay, There's always a kingdom being built inside the church, outside the church. God is doing work and we are the crew. We have been gifted with spiritual power tools, also known as spiritual gifts, to build the church. And he's calling us. When we fail, when we mess up, he's saying, do you love me? Yes. Come back. Do the work I've called you to. So listen, church, your failures don't bench you. Your, you messing up, you sinning and turning and, and going in the wrong way is not you know, dis, disqualifying you from working for God's purposes. Now, you know, we, we might put a caveat and say, yes, of course, sometimes there are things that we do or big mistakes that happen which really change how we can function in the church. You know, maybe I can't serve here because I really blew it and, you know, but, but it doesn't disqualify you from life with God and it doesn't disqualify you from working with Him. For those who are truly children of God, our failures do not define us. They are forgiven and now we can focus. That's the way of life with Jesus. From failure, through forgiveness, and into focus. For Peter, he, not to use too much alliteration, but he renounced Jesus. He, he was met with redemption and Jesus then reoriented him into the right way. That's the way it is with God. That is how God wants you to think about your failures. You don't have to pay for them by groveling and repeatedly dwelling on them and saying, God, I, you know, I need a new slate. I need a new slate. I need a new slate. That's not how it is. Come back into the way. So church, just to close, listen, don't disqualify yourself. And this is a real thing. I know. I felt it. I see it. And I don't know who needs this, but I know some of you watching need this message. Don't disqualify yourself. You feel like you're out. You feel like you're useless. You feel like you've gone too far. You've messed up too much and God's done with you. Listen, I'm telling you right now by the Spirit of God, God is not done with you. He is still there waiting, willing to work with you because the price has been paid. The failures have been forgiven and now he's calling you into focus. So would you join me in praying as we desire this? I hope that you desire this. This is what we as your elders desire for this church so that we can reach this community. Join me in praying. Father, your redeeming love is so good. And I know, you know, uh, uh, 30 or 40 minute sermon can't grasp all the goodness of God and yet God I just ask right now that people would hear that you are redeeming failures you are turning people and with your forgiveness drawing them into your way I pray you would give the people of Lake Windermere Alliance Church and anyone watching this focus for your kingdom. God, I pray we would live in the freedom of forgiveness, that we would rejoice and shine light, and that we'd be able to draw other people into you. God, we ask this through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.